are definitely living in the last days. And you all know that um, we see the signs everywhere. Um, one of the things that we must remember, and of course tomorrow morning I will be touching the effort, efforts that started in the Garden of Eden and continued throughout the ancient Egyptian, Assyrian, Babylonian, and Greek uh, uh, magicians to bring about eventually a one world government. And we'll, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, we'll talk about the fact that they were introducing to the world that pantheism, pantheos, everything is God. You know, the tree is a God, you are a God, the sky is God, the, everything is God. Therefore, there is no real one God. There is, you know, we're all gods. And, and that was, of course, it all started there. Uh, we, we'll talk about all of that, but you must understand that in order to get the people to be one, in order to accept one government and one world leader, and it's all about bringing the whole world one, you also must create a global, one world religious system because only religion brings about almost utmost or complete control of people. I don't need to tell you that religion controls people. Especially in the Philippines, you know that there are certain sects in the Philippines control literally the government, the military, the police, the judicial system. Control is the name. But you can imagine if one sect can control almost the entire country, how much more religion can control the whole world and what is how it's needed. Now, if you ever go to the book of Revelation and you, t you, you reach to chapter 17, you see that the writer, John, introduces to us in chapter 17 two beasts. One that will be rising from the ocean and another one that will be rising from the land. The rising from the ocean will be the Antichrist himself, which is the um, horrible, cruel world leader. But then you have the one that rises from the, from the land. That means he already exists. He's in the land. And he has the... Uh, the, uh, the um, the figure of four lambs, you know, the lamb, it, it looks innocent. He's more of the pointing at Jesus, the Lamb of God. It has to be some sort of a religious figure that will cause people to actually follow the beast, the first beast. You understand that? So we are expecting a world-dominant religion that will actually become almost the, the only one, and we're expecting it to usher the coming of the Antichrist. But if you really carefully examine the Scriptures, you'll see that at the end, uh, the Antichrist is killing the other beast. Which means that he will be using the leader of that world religion and then kill him. And for years I've been thinking and praying about, about that. Although I kind of knew, I needed proofs. You can't... You can't really convince people, and, and of course you can't even convince yourself without a smoking gun, we say. And of course, uh, we live in unbelievable times, and I thought, you know, it's about time for me to share that message, simply because um, this is it. We're, we're in the finish line. We, we must address that once and for all. Many people speculate about the world religion, the coming one world religion. I've heard more than one that it's going to be Islam. And they're saying Islam is the only religion that officially states that they want to take over the world. That's wrong. And that's not true. And if anything, Islam is the only religion that wants to take over the world, but by the power of the sword. That means we kill everyone who is not 
and we're going to have a bloodbath all over the world. And we will behead people. And in fact, they just revealed a couple days ago from documents that were proved to be uh, authentic that ISIS is planning a major world crisis that will help and assist them to fulfill their dreams to turn their whole world into a one big caliphate. And by the way, the reason why people are talking about Islam as the world religion because they really believe that the Antichrist will be a Muslim. Because the Muslims believe in the coming of the Mahdi, uh, the, um, the figure that will control the world. Let, let me explain to you one thing. Two things. Why I believe it's wrong. I'm a Jew. I'm an Israeli. I'm from the tribe of Judah. I don't know even a single Jew or Israeli that will ever receive a Muslim as his Messiah. To begin with. Second, I don't know why a Muslim Messiah must allow the Jews to build a temple and he must enter the Jewish temple in order to declare himself as God. So it cannot be a Muslim Antichrist and it surely is not Islam that will be the world religion. Now you're probably asking, so what is it going to be? Well, I'm going to say the framework of that religion exists it's just that it's emptying its content and it's refueling itself with new one. It's reshaping itself right now. And we are seeing an amazing shift in the last one year. That's why it's important that you know that. Now, Philippines is about 90% Catholic. Am I right? About 90% Catholic. What is it? 95 I want to believe it's only 90. <laughs> All right, I, I really want to believe that the, you know, there's about at least uh, 10 million you know, born again uh, here in this country. Yeah. So we, 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 want to, we want to be there. Now, everybody calls them Roman Catholics. But let me tell you something. They never called themselves in the beginning Roman Catholic. That which started actually in Constantinople in 325 AD wasn't really exactly Roman Catholic. It was just Catholic. Catholic means universal. That's the true meaning of it. Did you know that? Yeah. So it's not Roman Catholic. It's Catholic. Now... When I say universal, I mean that their aim, that it was meant to be, what? All over the world. It meant to be the religious frame of the whole world. That's why it's called universal. Not for any other reason. Judaism is not looking to recruit new members. Islam will only convert you by the power of the sword wherever they go and take over. Neither Hinduism nor Taoism or Buddhism is making the effort to recruit people in the four corners of the world and pouring billions of dollars to do so. The Catholic Church is the only religion on planet Earth that has a full-blown strategy to do so. I want you to be ready with your pencils and start writing the six steps of becoming the world religion. First one is the reconciliation efforts within the Catholic, the Christian world. The reconciliation efforts within the Christian. We have to understand it started as just Catholic. Then in the 10th century it split to Catholic and Orthodox. Then in the 1500 it split to the Protestant also. And today we have about almost 33,000 different splits. And, and 
that root, the mother root, wants to take back all that split out of it. And it, it pours enormous efforts in doing so. There's going to be a historical meeting shortly between the Pope and the Russian Orthodox Patriarch, Sergei Nikolai or something like that. And there is going, there's, there's an ongoing effort. The, the, the Anglican Church is already in the pocket of the Vatican. That's it. And they're working now, believe it or not, on the Protestants. In fact, they're doing an amazing job in recruiting Protestants right now. And when they do that, they don't even talk about Mary even one time. Ever since the creation of the Catholic Church, and certainly since the split in the 1500s, the first pope that ever addressed directly with a message to the Protestant Church. And I want you to see that message. It's just a few minutes. And I want you to see the language. And I thought, wow, this is a great speech. I, I almost convinced to become Catholic. Dear brothers and sisters, excuse me, because I speak in Italian, but I I'm not uh, speaking English, but uh, I will speak uh, no Italian, no English, but carefully. È una lingua più semplice e più autentica. E questa lingua del cuore ha un linguaggio e una grammatica speciale, la grammatica semplice, due regole, ama Dio soprattutto e ama l'altro perché il tuo fratello e la tua sorella e con queste due cose andiamo avanti. Io sono qui con mio fratello mio vescovo fratello Tony Palmer, siamo amici da anni e lui mi ha detto di, del vostro compegno, del vostro raduno, e con piacere vi invio un saluto, un saluto gioioso e nostalgico. Gioioso perché eh, a me da gioia che, che voi siete riuniti per lodare Gesù Cristo, l'unico Signore, eh, per eh, pregare al Padre e ricevere lo Spirito. E questo dà gioia perché si vede che il Signore lavora in tutto il mondo. È nostalgico perché... Ma succede come nei quartieri fra noi, no? nei quartieri ci sono famiglie che si vogliono e famiglie che non si vogliono, famiglie che si uniscono e famiglie che si separano e noi siamo un po', mi permetto la parola, separati, separati perché i peccati ci hanno separati, i nostri peccati, e i malintesi nella storia, ma una lunga strada di peccato comunitario, ma chi ha la colpa? Tutti abbiamo la colpa, tutti siamo peccatori, soltanto uno è il giusto, il Signore. E io ho la nostalgia che questa separazione finisca che ci dia la comunione, la nostalgia di quell'abbraccio di qua, nel, nel quale parla la Sacra Scrittura, quando i fratelli di Giuseppe affamati sono andati a Egitto per comprare per poter mangiare, 
ma andavano a comprare, avevano i soldi, ma non potevano mangiare i soldi. E lì hanno trovato qualcosa più del pasto, hanno trovato il fratello. Tutti noi abbiamo dei soldi, i soldi della cultura, i soldi della nostra storia, di tante ricchezze culturali, anche religiose, tra, tradizioni diverse. Ma dobbiamo trovarci come fratelli e dobbiamo piangere insieme, come ha fatto Giuseppe quel pianto che unisce, il pianto dell'amore. Io vi parlo come fratello eh? e vi parlo così semplicemente, con gioia e nostalgia, facciamo crescere la nostalgia perché questo ci spingerà a trovarci, a abbracciarci e a lodare Gesù Cristo come unico Signore della storia. Vi ringrazio tanto per sentirmi. Vi ringrazio tanto per lasciarmi parlare la lingua del cuore. E vi chiedo anche un favore di pregare per me perché ho bisogno delle vostre preghiere. Io prego per voi, eh? lo farò, ma io ho bisogno delle vostre preghiere e pregare al Signore perché ci unisca tutti. E avanti, siamo fratelli, ci diamo spiritualmente questo abbraccio e lasciamo che il Signore finisca l'opera che Lui ha incominciato. Perché questo è un miracolo, il miracolo dell'unità è incominciato. E dice uno scrittore italiano, il Manzoni, il famoso, dice questa frase in un romanzo, un uomo, un uomo semplice del popolo dice questa frase «Non ho trovato mai che il Signore abbia incominciato un miracolo senza finirlo bene». Lui finirà bene questo miracolo dell'unità. Vi chiedo di benedirmi e io vi benedico. Di fratello a fratello. Un abbraccio. Grazie. I do not hear Mary even once. And it's a very beautiful speech. Let's, let's face it. It's very good. I'm telling you, I almost became Catholic. <laughs> and I want you to understand that what you see here is this. He declared that the division has come to an end. The other side declared that that's it, the division has come to an end. Guys, it is going viral all over the world amongst the Protestant church. You can go online and see all of that. I was shocked. And the reason why I'm saying all of that, because there is a well-planned strategy here. Don't fall into those sweet words, because the, this is not so innocent. No one here says that we acknowledge that Mary is not goddess. No one here says that we acknowledge that the wine is not real blood of Jesus and the bread is not the real body of Jesus. Nobody here acknowledges all the differences. All they say is that it is the glory that unites us and the love of one each other and, and let's move forward. And if you listen carefully, those who are Protestant should be Catholic not, not, not the opposite. I never heard there that the Catholics are now becoming Protestant. The protest has come to an end. 
Therefore, you come back here. It turns the hearts of the sons to the fathers. That's what they say. But the most powerful thing that uh, Mr. Palmer said, which, by the way, he just died in a car accident, in a, a motorcycle accident just a few months ago, um, that Anglican young bishop. Now, I want you to know that the most interesting thing he said, and we all know that Elijah must come before the second coming of the Lord. Of course, he was quoting Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. We all know about that. And think about it. When was Malachi 4 fulfilled? Through who? John the Baptist. He came in the spirit of Elijah, remember? He indeed came to prepare the way of the Lord before Jesus came. What that bishop said is that Elijah must come before the second coming. It's not mentioned in the scripture. What he's doing is very smart. He's paving the way to have the religious leader of the world religion announced as Elijah. And that's why we call it the false prophet. You understand that? And he's going to usher the coming of a Messiah, but it's not going to be Jesus. It's the Antichrist. You see, the strategy here is we must unite the spirit of reconciliation. Soon, the leader of our new religion is going to be appearing as if he's Elijah, and he's definitely going to usher the coming of our Messiah, which we know is not the real Messiah, is the Antichrist. You know, we have to remind ourselves, in Galatians, Chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, it says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is, not, he is to be accursed. And then he says, As we have said before, so I say again now. Wow, he's very persistent here. He says, you know, I said it once, but let me repeat it. I'm going to say it again. He says it again now. He says, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. The word accursed in the Greek is anathema. And it is a much stronger form than just curse. I don't want to go into that. But what I'm saying is, the Bible is warning us that people that actually will be so highly esteemed, even as angels from heaven... They might come and they will give us a different gospel from what we know and we can never accept it, even not under the wings and under the cover of the, the glory of God and the spirit of reconciliation. And if that's not enough, we must remember that there is more to that in fact, um, Romans 16, verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, know those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn and avoid them. It is about the doctrine. It's not about the glory. You understand? They try to tell you, forget about the doctrine. It's about the glory. Forget about the glory. Not that there's no glory, but it's all about the doctrine. Now, if you learn a different doctrine, how can you expect the glory to come? When you were warned. And, and, and if that's not enough, we see also um, that it is an ongoing process. Now, it, it started last year, and it's gaining momentum, and it goes viral. And that is only the first point. Now, we all know that there are religious wars all around the world. We all know that there are nature disasters that are about to come. Hey, we all know it's coming. Jesus said that. I just talked about it last message. But you all know that when those type of disasters and catastrophes are happening, 
the first thing that happens, everybody runs to religion. Everybody wants to run to the house of God. Everybody wants to hold on to the altar. Everybody wants to find God because God knows what's next and I don't want to be found guilty and I need God. And then you, you see that there is a crisis that is around the corner, a religious one. You see, ISIS is posing a very interesting dilemma for hundreds of millions of Muslims. Why? Because I believe that hundreds of millions of Muslims are not out there to behead people. I believe that it's a very small group. But that small group says we are the true Muslims. We are indeed fulfilling what Muhammad says. Everybody else is not a true Muslim because they don't follow Muhammad. They don't follow his scriptures. We do. And so now you have hundreds of millions of Muslims. They're asking themselves, if that's Islam, so what are we? Because we're definitely not in that type of thing. And, and then you see the Israelis, the Jewish people, are going to go through a terrible world war that is going to include weapons of mass destruction. They will definitely yearn and look forward to somehow a deliverer to come. And then you see that um, all those things that are coming eventually will cause different religions to look for an answer. And that is exactly point number two. The Catholics started what we call the interfaith movement. Not only from within, now we, wa we work between the religions. They started long ago the ecumenical movement of bringing together all different religions and holding hands and singing Kumbaya. But now, it's way beyond that. Now it's in full swing. Now, you know, I remember the day, and it was December of 2000, when I was sitting in Los Angeles, and I read the Los Angeles Times, and I stumbled into the uh, little um, article in the religion section of the LA Times, and it says, Pope John Paul takes inclusive stand on salvation. I said, wow, that's very interesting. And I read it, you know, I don't believe newspapers, especially not when it comes to the Pope and when it comes to uh, his sermons. So what I did, I went immediately to the website of the Vatican. Because if we talk about a sermon given there, it's all documented. So I went and I searched, and I found from indeed, from December 6, 2000, Pope John, uh, John Paul II in a general audience on Wednesday, December 6, and he said the following words, and I quoted, I took it from the actual Vatican site. He says, those who have chosen the way of the gospel beatitudes and live as, in, as, as the poor in spirit, detach from material goods in order to raise up the lowly of the earth from the dust of their humiliation, will enter the kingdom of God. All the just of the earth, including those who do not know Christ and His church, who under the influence of grace seek God with a sincere heart, are thus called to build the kingdom of God. You don't have to know Christ or belong to His church to be part of the kingdom of God. All you need is have sincere heart. You can be one of the hundreds of millions of Muslims that you really have a sincere heart. You don't agree with ISIS. You will be part of the kingdom of God. You can be part of the millions of Jews that sincerely don't want war anymore and they want peace finally after all the attempts to destroy them. You will be part of the kingdom of God. You can be part of, of uh, the uh, other religions that are really all about peace, Hinduism and, and Buddhism and all of that. You all be part of the kingdom of God because all it takes is to have a good heart, to be a good person person and to do good things. And I, if you don't believe that, then I, I suggest that you move to Pope Francis Domus Sancte Marta Chapel when he gave a morning meditation on May 22nd, 2013. And I took it from the Vatican website and he said, the Lord created us in his image. And if he does good, let us all keep this commandment in our heart. Do good and do not evil. Everyone. The Lord redeemed everyone with Christ's blood. Everyone, not only Catholics, everyone. And atheists, they also too. It is the blood that makes us children of God. Just do good. 
Be a good person. Even if you're an atheist. Now if that's not enough, 12 days ago, this is a picture taken at the Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. You know what you're looking at? It's a yoga class. These are all mattresses. And, next, and, and they're doing a yoga class all throughout down the aisle. The Catholic Church has opened the doors for everyone to come and do yoga to bring about peace. Yoga brings you into meditation and it's good energy and it promotes peace. So the Catholic Church, it's the Grace Cathedral, the largest Catholic Cathedral in San Francisco, is now hosting a regular yoga classes all down the aisle, all around, all areas, just to bring peace. We're not, a, you know, we want everyone to enjoy. In fact, there is the United Nations that goes for one world government. Well, the United Nations gave birth to the United Religions. Look at this. That's the United Religions initiative of the United Nations. That's their logo, URI. Interesting, isn't it? By the way, that's just the logo of the North American brand. But there's Europe, there's Asia, they're all over. They meet together and they declare that it's a one religion. They declare that there's no differences between the religions. They declare that it's all the same. So, we work first to unite the Christian body from within. Then we reach out and we, we pour billions to reach out to all the other religions, including telling them from the pulpit that they are okay as long as they are, as they are good hearts and, you know, and, and, and they do good. They, they will be part of the kingdom of God. That we will accept them. They don't have to change. They don't have to be Catholic. They just have to be part of us. <laughs> Number three. Closing the gap with the science and Darwinism. Ladies and gentlemen, closing the gap with the science and Darwinism. Now, I want you to understand that um, for years, science is a very, very big problem for Christianity. Because science claims that there was the Big Bang, Remember? And science claimed that there is the evolution, that, 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 you know, that God is not a magician that created things as they are. It had to be evolved from one thing into another. For years, this is the stand of the church. To not agree with that. The church always preached what we call intelligence, intelligent creation. God created an, an intelligent person. No, he didn't have to evolve into being intelligent. No. Well, when the Pope visited one of the scient uh, scientific uh, institutions recently, that's what he said. He said, evolution and the Big Bang Theory are real. And when they asked him, what do you mean? He says, well, God is not a magician. In fact, um, let, I, I think, I think that I, I, I wrote it. Um, I guess I didn't. Okay, he says, God is not a magician. He did not use a magic wand to create things as they are. He would create something and it will evolve to what it is now. He, in fact, he says, it, it, the creation is not a, in contradiction. Because it had to have started somehow, so the Big Bang is okay. And it had to have evolved somehow, so evolution is okay. Are you shocked as I am? All right. So now we close the gap with the science. And now scientists can easily belong to a, a religion that accepts them and, and sees them part of the institution. 
They're not condemned. So wow, now we see that, that the new look of Catholicism is very intelligent. They're, they're enlightened. They're, they've seen the light now. They, now they know what we've been saying for years. Number four. Understanding. Now, I'm not saying promoting. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying understanding radical Islamic terrorism. Understanding. How many of you know that in January of this year, there was a horrible terrorist attack in the heart of Paris on the Charlie Hebdo uh, magazine that... Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, had a character or a, a cartoon of Muhammad. Two brothers, armed to their teeth, stormed into that that place and uh, sprayed everyone and killed twelve people. The next day, the Pope was asked about it, and look what he said: Pope Francis on Charlie Hebdo. He says, "You cannot insult the faith of others." In other words. He almost said they deserved it. And then when I asked him, what do you mean? It, and, and that, by the way, that interview was on the plane. When they're flying from one place to another, one of his trips. And he says, well, if somebody would come and cuss my mother and say bad things about my mother, I will smack him also. Ah, you understand what I just said? Instead of mourning over the death of 12 people, instead of saying religion has no place for any murder, any killing, what has been shown here is that an understanding of those radical feelings. Now, he's not promoting, he's not saying any. he just says that he understands. He says, I understand. So now even the radical Muslims find understanding in that religion. There is no other religion on planet Earth that will accept it. Or even understand it. But here, we have an understanding. So they're saying, well, you know what? We're not that bad after all. Somebody in that statue understands us. Number five. Embracing the LGBT community. The, the lesbian, gay, bi, transsexual community. Now, how? The Telegraph, one of the most important newspapers in the United Kingdom, on March 10, 2014 says, Pope says Catholic Church should not dismiss gay marriage. The Catholic Church should not dismiss out of hand civil unions, but should study them, says Pope Francis, in latest softening of stance on thorny social issues. They later on interviewed a Catholic priest of a gay parish who apparently comes to Rome on a, on a pilgrimage every year. And he said, prior to Francis, I used to bring only 15 people. Nobody would, you know, sign up for that. Ever since Pope Francis, we're filling out buses. Busloads are coming because we feel okay. We feel comfortable with who we are and what we do, and, and it's okay. Well, we have an understanding there, too. And number six. Collaboration with the efforts to create a one world government. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me explain to you. The effort to bring one world government has been going on from the beginning of planet Earth. Ever since we know each other, they gathered together to be one and build a tower, a temple on the top, to declare that down here and up there it's the same. Coming together as one is our power, they thought. So what did God do? Disperse them. Different languages, different countries, different nations. Because if there's one thing that you do well when you come together, is you come against me. 
You don't come together to pray and worship me. You come together to replace me. Now, there's a problem. The problem is that nations are in love with themselves. And especially in times of trouble, they become very, I would say, patriotic. When Yolanda hit the Philippines, everybody were waving the Filipino flag, you were all united, everybody did, you know, you were proud to be Filipinos and you did whatever it takes to help your brothers and sisters and to tell the whole world that we are proud. And, you know, when some terrorist attacks are attacking Marines on American soil, everybody goes out with American flags and shows an amazing display of unity. Well, after 9-11, you should have seen, I was there, you know, I, you know, I was in New York, I was on those buildings the night before, I don't know if I ever told you that. In fact, on that day before, I asked what's going to happen if something's going to hit those buildings. Now, you know I'm not a prophet. I told you that. I was on those towers the last... I saw the last sunset from the top of these towers because the next morning they were gone. But you should have seen America after. Yes, they licked their wound, but at the same time, the greatest... Remember, when, when, when President Bush came to the area of Ground Zero and with a flag and everybody says USA USA it was amazing I had chills it was unbelievable but th that's the problem of those who seek for one world government they don't want it so they were looking and looking and looking what is it that we can really frighten the world and cause so much fear that everybody will forget about their flags and their national anthems and their parliament and their soldiers and their president and they will understand that there is an urgency to come together what is the one thing that we have no control over and it affects the whole world regardless of countries, nations, and flags? Climate. Climate. And then what they do, they use NASA to, to, to send people every, every day to, to say that catastrophe is coming, the, the uh, planet Earth is warming up, CO2 reach a, a, you know, record levels. And then they say, well, uh, you know, it's not really working. So they're saying to the Pope, you better talk about it too. And the Pope just wrote a, a letter in which he is calling for a world government to deal with the climate crisis. Why? Because there's only one way to deal with crime. What's the deal? If I control the United States and I'm a good president and I cause my people to reduce the, their consumption of CO2, but the other country is not doing that, it's not going to work. We need a world authority that supervises and regulates everyone the same. We cannot rely on, on leaders to do that. We need one central leadership to do that. And that's what he said. That's what we need. So it goes beyond religion now. It goes to usher the need, the urgent need. And then they say that in, in, in a few years, all the glaciers will melt and the sea will rise and it's going to uh, go and, and uh, flood all the, all the islands in the world, including you. And then I hear yesterday that actually they're talking about an, another era of ice age. I, I really want them to make up their mind. Are they melting or are we freezing? What's going on here? <laughs> the funny thing is, they don't tell you the truth. No one tells you the truth. All scientists that knows the truth are being paid not to tell you the truth. But the truth is that throughout history, we always had times when it was hotter and times when it was colder. You can't do anything about it. It's not about CO2, you cannot regulate it, you cannot control it, but who cares about the truth? If we make it to, to have the people believe that it is within their hand to stop it, then they will want one world government, won't they? And that's what we care about. So ladies and gentlemen, a religion that embraces all the fractions within a religion that embraces all other religions from outside, a religion that embraces science, 
a religion that embraces an understanding of radical terrorism, a religion that embraces sexual immorality as a way that we should look into it and understand that a unity may not be such a bad idea after all, a religion that is even embracing the need for a world government. I'm not sure what the name of that religion is going to be, but I sure know that you all know what religion we're talking about, and you all know that the leader of that religion eventually will be the false prophet. I'm sorry to say, if you're offended, I'm sorry. But I'm here to tell you the truth, and the truth sometimes hurts. But you have to wake up, and you have to understand that we live in the, in the end. We live in the very end. The false prophet will usher the arrival of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will use him and then crush him and will kill him. That religion will not even last for too long when the head of that religion will actually be killed by the Antichrist. But it sure will prepare the ground for the coming of the Antichrist. That's how alarming the situation and the reality in this world to be. So I hope that we've all gained a better understanding of the situation around us. I hope you understand that the scriptures don't tolerate that. There is no room for you to think that you are the bad guys because you are not part of this unity. There is no reason for you to believe that uh, you have a problem and not them. And it is the time for all of us to wake up. I believe that so many people don't understand and don't even know what we shared this morning. And I believe that if you only prayed and exposed it, many of them will run to Christ for true salvation and true redemption. And it is within our hands. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Amen? Amen. Amen.